Okay. So we're going to continue with our discussion of of uh, root finding techniques. I'm going to do a lot of applications today. Um, and then uh, we have our exam is a week from today, correct? Is that right? So a week from today will be our exam. So I'll have some more information for you about that, as I promised about logistics for taking it remotely. I'll probably at some point, maybe through Slack or something, I we'll just kind of need to get an, a sense for how many of you plan to take it in person in the room. So as I've said, we basically can accommodate as many as want to be here physically in the room. The capacity is 38, I believe in this auditorium and we only have just over 40 some students. So, but I just need to know how many exams to bring basically. So at some point, watch for that. Uh, so we'll get all those things sorted out shortly the next next few days all right so we started talking about the static nonlinear spring problem before i got myself all riled up so i'll try not to do that uh quite yet <laughs> anyway so we have a nonlinear spring L let me just say too about these applications so like i said i'm going to spend most of the class today on applications the emphasis of this class specifically is on numerical methods and it's not on the applications. However, I want you to see where the applications are. Why is it that we as engineers care about these methods? And why is it as engineers that we need to be able to use these methods? So whenever you see me do an example that is an application, so basically everything today, the underlying methods, in this case, Newton's method is the thing that we're concerned with in this class, the actual application is not our primary consideration. So I'll work through the examples. I'll even do the free body diagrams for this nonlinear spring example. We'll walk through that. However, that's not something that you need to be concerned with. Oh, do I have to go back and review 200 or 202, or I'm going to do some examples from 313 and, and some other things as well. So the answer to that is no. So don't get, um, again, the applications are, are really intended to help us see and be reminded of the fact that these are really useful techniques that are used uh, in a widespread way throughout engineering. Okay, so back to our static nonlinear spring example with that in mind. So we have our two masses and our two springs and it's static, so it's not moving. It's not wobbling up and down or anything. We're just gonna let the masses find their equilibrium position. The difference now is that the E word, I can't say it because if I say it, it makes me think of someone. And if I think of someone, then I get distracted. But if the E word is now squared, so the spring constant times the E word squared, that's now nonlinear. So for a linear spring, it's just k times x. For a nonlinear spring, it could be anything. In our case, we I went to Home Depot and I went to the spring aisle and I found some springs that uh, work according to k times x squared. Fine. So I bought them, I bring them home, and I build this wobbly spring mass system in my basement, and this is what I get. Okay, so that that's the whole point now. So well, we want to solve this. So we do the usual thing. We draw our free body diagrams. So let's do free body diagram for one, and then we'll do free body diagram for mass two. So for the upper mass, we have its weight. So that's M1 times G. Then we have the force up will be K1 times X1 squared. And then the force down is K2 times X2 minus X1 squared. And then we do the free body diagram for the second mass, the lower mass, M2. 
So now that has its weight, M2G, and the force up, which is the same as the force down on the, the upper mass is K2, X2 minus X1 squared. Great. So then we do some of the forces, in this case, in the vertical direction, and we sum them to zero. So for free body diagram one here on the left, I have M1G down plus K2 times X2 minus X1 squared down, and then K1 X1 squared up, so that's negative, and then sum them to zero. Great. Same thing for free body diagram two. I have M2G down and K2 X2 minus X1 squared up. So here's the point. So I want to solve this problem, but now I get a system of two nonlinear equations instead of just one. It's a system of two nonlinear equations for two variables, X1 and X2. So we know how to do, and what we've done so far is one equation, nonlinear equation for one variable, f of x. Now I have two f of x's, and those f of x's are both functions of two variables, x1 and x2. So how can we adapt Newton's method to find the solution, the values of x1 and x2 that satisfy both of these nonlinear equations? All right, so that's what we need to do. And so I'll, I'll develop the approach first, and then we'll come back to this example and, and show how to solve it using Newton's method applied for multiple equations or in this systems of nonlinear equations. So same underlying idea. I will warn you now, here's your warning for the day. This is not easy, okay? So it's multi-dimensional Taylor series. It's same idea as what we've done for f of x with Newton's method, but this is going to look a whole lot harder. So I'm just warning you right now so that you're not surprised. So instead of just having an f of x is equal to zero, now we're going to have an f1 is equal to zero, and f2 is equal to zero, and we actually have n of them. So we have n nonlinear algebraic equations, f1 through fn, and each one of them is a function of n variables so x1 through xn so rather than one variable and one function we have n variables and n functions but again the basic idea the basic underlying approach is the same we're going to use the taylor series expansion just like we did in the one dimensional case but now it's a multi-dimensional taylor series so the same basic approach but it just looks a whole lot messier so we're going to do the taylor series about the x and k values, and of course there's n of the capital N of those, at the current iteration. So all the superscript k's, remember that's indicating the iteration number. So they're just kind of coming along for the ride. Don't worry about them. They, they don't really enter into the derivation at all. They're just coming along for the ride. So those are the iteration numbers. So like this, f1 at x1, k, x2, k, and so forth, that is evaluating the function f1 for the given values of x1, x2, x3, up to xn at the kth iterate, whatever those numbers happen to be. And this is, remember, it's an iterative process, so k will be incremental. Start off with k is equal to zero with the initial guess, then k equals one after the first iteration, two, three, four, five, and on and on and on until we have converged to the root, to the solution. Okay. So F1 at some generic set of variables X1 through Xn is equal to F1 at the X1 through Xn evaluated at the kth iterate. Presumably these are different now because these are approximations to these. They're not the correct values, they're approximations. So the Taylor series says that they're different by an amount equal to delta xk partial f1 partial x1. Then same thing, but for two, delta x2, delta x3, four, all the way up to n. So in the previous Taylor series, we had one of these terms, one of these terms, 
And the next term was a delta x squared. And that we truncated, and that was what gave us the convergence rate, second order, and so on. Now, rather than just one first derivative term and one second derivative term, third derivative term, now we have n first derivative terms and n more second derivative terms and n more third derivative terms. So that's what I mean. It, it, it's the same idea, but it gets much more complicated looking. The delta x is just like before. That's just the difference between the actual root and our current approximation of that root. So delta x and k is xn minus xn k. So that's why you see them here. It's the distance. Now you notice I've only shown the first derivative terms. This plus dot, dot, dot includes all the second derivative terms, all the third derivative terms, all the way up to infinity. But we're going to neglect those anyway. We're going to truncate the Taylor series just like we did before after these first derivative terms. OK, so that's where we're at. Now, what do we do with this? Well, this is just for F1. I have to do the same thing for F2 through Fn. So I'm going to have capital N of these Taylor series. Each one of them has N first order derivative terms. So, so if I haven't said it already, it's a mess. It's a horrendous mess. But here's what it ends up looking like. You end up getting a big system of equations that you need to solve. And I'll, I'll walk us through how that comes about. If we set each of the Taylor series equal to zero, so why do I do that? Well, F1 is equal to zero, F2 is equal to zero, F3 is equal to zero. So let's set F1 given by its Taylor series equal to zero. We'll do that for all N of the Taylor series. So I set them all equal to zero. I'm going to truncate all the quadratic terms, which I haven't even shown. And then we'll express it in matrix form. And the reason why it ends up being in a matrix form is because we have multiple unknowns now. Rather than just one unknown, we have capital N unknowns. So here's what the matrix equation, matrix form of the equation looks like. We're going to have an A matrix you see right here, we'll, I'll walk us through that. We have the solution vector, that's all of the delta x's that we're looking for. And then we have the right-hand side vector minus f, which is all these minus f1, minus f2, and so forth. In the 1D case, remember what this was. This was df dx, this is for f of x is equal to zero. We had df dx times delta x is equal to minus f. We solve for delta x, so we had minus f over f prime. That's what we had, that was equation 5.1 from last time for the 1D case. So now we have basically the same thing, it's just the multidimensional version of it. So rather than just one delta x, we have n delta x's, rather than just one partial f partial x, one first derivative, we now have n times n of them. Because if you look at the Taylor series, each one has the derivative of f, its variable f1 with respect to all of the x's. But then the second equation has all the derivatives of f2 with respect to all the x's again. And the third equation, fourth equation, fifth equation, all the way to the nth equation. So I have n times n of these possible first derivatives. Partial f1 with respect to each of the n derivatives, partial f2 with respect to the n, f3 all the way to fn and xn. So that's why instead of just having a single algebraic equation like this for delta x, we now have a system of algebraic equations for the delta x's, all n of them. So that's what we end up with. Now, the good news is it's a linear system of algebraic equations. Why is that good news? 
because we just spent several weeks talking about how to solve linear systems of algebraic equations. So I know how to solve this. I just have to evaluate all these Fs and all these first derivatives. Once I do that, I can solve for the delta Xs and that's one iteration. So I have to actually solve this system of equations for each iteration. Each iteration, all the Fs are gonna be different and all the first derivatives are gonna be different, which I'll, I'll walk us through that in a moment. All right, any questions so far on this? So here it is in matrix form. Here it is all written out. And again, I'll talk about the details of the F and the A matrix in a moment. The key is, and, and this is clearly indicated in the matrix form here, is all of these are at, evaluated at the kth iteration. Here, I haven't, I haven't done that except for the delta x's because it, it would be a mess. But really, this is F1k, F2k. This is partial F1k, partial x1, partial F1k, partial F2. So again, I'll, I'll walk us through that uh, for our example, the nonlinear spring example in a moment. Once we've solved for all the delta x's, then we update our estimate for where the roots are. So we take the old estimates, the old approximations, x and k from the kth iterate. We add the delta x's that we just got from the solution of the linear system of algebraic equations. And that gives us a better, well, what we hope is a better, more accurate estimate or approximation of the roots at the k plus first iterate. So k is equal to one is gonna be our initial guess. We choose. Then we'll do one iteration of this, solve the system of equations, update the values of x, that gives us x1. And then, well, x1, 1, x2, 1, x3, 1. And then we solve the system of equations again. We update these values. Now, k is 2. And we just iterate like that over and over again until we get the solution. The determinant of A, not A itself, but the determinant A is called the Jacobian. When you hear the term Jacobian, just think, oh, that's, that's a vector or matrix of first derivatives. If it's one function, then it's, a, it's the derivatives of that function with respect to all of the variables. If it's multiple functions, then it's gonna be a matrix, but the Jacobian is always just a vector or matrix of first derivatives. Then the order of this system of equations, in order for it to have a unique solution then, the Jacobian has to be non-zero. So that just goes back to our discussion of linear algebra, linear systems of equations. For A, X, or A, U is equal to B, to have a unique solution, the determinant of A has to be non-zero. If it's zero, then it's singular, it doesn't have an inverse, and it doesn't have a unique solution. So what that means for us here is the Jacobian must be non-zero. The determinant of this has to be non-zero in order for it to have a unique solution. So once again, this is the whole point of Newton's method, whether it's 1D or multidimensional, is that it converts a system of nonlinear algebraic equations into a system of linear equations. So we go from a system of nonlinear equations for the xi's to a linear system of linear equations for the delta xi's. And again, we like that because we know how to solve it. Okay, so let's come back to our nonlinear spring example and show how we would apply this technique, this Newton's method to this problem. So now capital N is two. We have two variables, x1 and x2. We have two functions, f1 and f2. You see f1 is that first equation, f2 is that second equation, and then of course these are just equal to zero for static equilibrium. So the way we would do this, we have our f1 and f2, that goes on the right-hand side. So I have the right-hand side functions that go into the right-hand side vector, f1, f2 through fn, in this case, f1 and f2. Now I need the first derivatives. Now, if n is equal to two, I'm just gonna have this little two by two 
matrix A. So I need partial F1, partial X, partial F1, partial X2, partial F2, partial X1, and partial F2, partial X2. So let's evaluate those. So I'm just taking the partial derivatives of these with respect to X1 and X2. So let's do F1 first with respect to X1. So partial F1, partial X1. The first term vanishes because those are all constants. K2 is a constant. So partial derivative of this with respect to X1 will be two. So two times K, K2. Then the derivative of the inside is minus one with respect to X1. So minus two K2, X2 minus X1. And then this term has an X1 in it. So that's also gonna be a minus two K1, X1. Then we do the same thing with respect to X2. So this term vanishes. This term doesn't have an X2 in it, so that one's gone. And we differentiate this with respect to X2. So it's 2K2 times X2 minus X1. And the derivative of the thing inside is just one with respect to X2. Then the second equation. So now F2, partial derivative with respect to X1. No X1 here, so that's gone. And then minus K2 times two times X2 minus X1 times minus one. So that's 2k2 x2 minus x1. And then with respect to x2, this is gone. Now the inside derivative is just one. So it's minus 2k2 x2 minus x1. Okay, so those are my four first derivatives that fill up my matrix A. This is one, 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 two. So first row, first column, first row, second column, second row, first column and second row, second column. Just fill it in our little two by two matrix. As I go through and iterate, the X1s and X2s are gonna be changing. They'll start with my initial guess for X1 and X2, as you'll see, and then we iterate. So we'll update X1 and X2, update X1 and X2. So these values, the actual value of partial F1, partial X1 at each iteration is gonna change, as, as you'll see just like the values of F change. I put in different values of X1 and X2 as I iterate, as I update my estimates and approximations for X1 and X2, the values of F1 also are gonna get updated, as you'll see. All right, so in matrix form then, I have my two by two matrix A of first derivatives. I have my two delta Xs that I'm looking for, delta X1 and delta X2. And then I have my two Fs, minus F1, minus F2. Now, I'm gonna, again, we'll do this for our particular example, but whenever you see this F1, that's this, evaluated for the current values of X1 and X2. So Xk, X1k and X2k. And then whenever you see F2, well, that's this, evaluated for X1k, X2k. So they're just numbers, but they're new numbers for every iteration because the values of X1 and X2 are changing as we iterate. Same thing with the A matrix. So again, while I have not indicated the Ks here and here, you have to remember that they are changing as I iterate through the case. So it's FK and AK. So again, these are the first derivatives. I have the general exp analytical expressions for them, but I need to evaluate those for the given values of X1, K and X2, K as I iterate. Okay, so let's take an example, let's simplify things. Let's make both masses one, both of the K constants one, and we'll put this on the earth. So G will be 9.81. Then my initial guess is gonna be X1 is one and X2 is zero. I didn't think about it at all. I just picked two different numbers. So you'd be able to see how those go into the F calculation and into the first derivative calculations as well. So here's what A looks like. I'll walk us through that. Times X delta X1 delta X2 is equal to F and I'll walk us through that. So let's look at F first. So remember, all the M's are one, all the K's are one, G is 9.81, and the initial guess for X1 is one, and X2 is two. Easy even for me to remember. So let's look at how the 
right-hand side vector comes about. So remember those values, let's go back. So here's F1. So M1 is one, G is 9.81, so that's 9.81. K2 is one, X2 minus X1, that's two minus one. Whoop, let me count on my toes, that's one. One squared is one, one times one is one. So I have 9.81 plus one, and then minus K1, which is one times one squared, X1, again, initial guess is one. So that's minus one. So plus one minus one, I just get back 9.81. Sure hope I have a 9.8, oh, I do, good. So that's just minus 9.81. Then for this value, again, the same inputs. So now I'm looking at F2, so that's, one times 9.81 minus one times two minus one squared. That's one squared, which is one times one is one. So it's 9.81 minus one, which get out my fingers and toes again, is minus 8.81. Okay, it's as simple as that. It's tedious, but it's straightforward. Now for the A matrix, same idea, but now we're looking at these first derivatives. So in the first row, first column, this is minus two times one times two minus one, which is minus two for this whole term, minus two times one times one, which is minus two, minus two minus two is I think, last time I checked, minus four. Okay, that's good. So then partial F partial x2, partial f1, partial x2. So two times one times two minus one is two. Dun, 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 two. f2, uh, sorry, partial f2, partial x1, two times one times one is two. And then for partial f2, partial x2, it's minus two times one times one is minus two. So I have a two and a minus two. Now that's just for the first iteration, okay? That's just to get the k is equal to zero updates. I then solve the system of equations, which I'll show you on the next slide what the answer is for that. Then once I have my delta x1 and delta x2 zero, I use those to update the initial guesses. So it'll be one plus, one plus the solution that I get here. And then X2 at the initial, for the initial guess, that's two. So two plus whatever I get from right here, solving the system of equations. And that gives me my next estimates for X1 and X2. Here's the key. Here's the thing we need to make sure we understand. For each iteration, I need to reevaluate these numbers. The equations for F1 and F2 don't change. The equations for partial F1, partial X1, partial F1, partial X2, partial F2, partial X1, partial F2, partial X2, I think I got all those right. Those don't change. But when I substitute in the new values of X1 and X2, they do. So these numbers will be different for the next iteration. So when I solve it, I will, of course, get different values. So here's what it looks like. The solution to this system right here to get delta x1, delta x2 for k is equal to zero gives me 9.31 and 13.715. I then update the values of x1 and x2 according to what we just had on the previous slide, and so that's 10.31 and 15.715. So those are the new approximations. Remember, we started with one and two. So the new approximations are 10 and 15.715. I'll show you what the exact solution is in a moment. And things are actually getting worse before they get better, but that's okay. So that's the first iteration. That's K is equal to zero. Then we do it all again. So now we use these values for X1 and X2 rather than one and two. We reevaluate the Fs on the right-hand side reevaluate all the first derivatives on the left-hand side in A. We solve that system of equations 
and we get these two values, minus 4.2 and minus 5.99. Because they're both negative, they're saying, oh, you idiot. In that first iteration, you overshot the solution, but that's fine. Newton's method brings us back, and now we're at 6.1, 9.7. Then you do it all again with these new values of x1 and x2. Obviously, you're, when you code this, you're putting it into an iterative loop, and then you keep doing it until these values converge, until they're not changing very much, just like in the 1D case. So I've done one, two, three, four iterations. If you'd like, if you're so inclined, then you, know, you can recreate these and check my numbers and build your confidence that, that this is all working out correctly and you, you understand it. Here are the exact solutions for the M's and the K's and the G's that uh, we used. So 4.429 and 7.56. And we're at 4.435 and 7.567 after just four iterations. So you can see it's, it's honing in on the correct answers pretty quickly. So that's all good. Any questions about that? Any questions about my thoughts on GameStop? Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I'm sure I can be enticed at some point to give you my thoughts if, if anyone cares. All right. So again, the only difference now is within each iteration, we're still iterating the same way, but within each iteration, we're solving a system of linear algebra equations rather than just this one equation delta x is equal to minus f over f prime. All right, so I have a, some additional nonlinear examples for mechanical and aerospace engineering. Again, I'm just trying to help us make connections between what we're learning in this class and how they might be implemented or used or why they'd be used in other classes and other topics that we're taking. This is a methods class. You're not learning new physics like you are in almost every other one of your engineering classes. So you're not learning new physics, you're learning a new tool. So in your math classes, you learn tools, tools how to solve your, your engineering problems. This is an additional set of tools that are extremely powerful for solving our engineering problems. So I, I really wanna give you a sense for how uh, widespread and how important these are these methods are in terms of engineering applications. Again, I'm not teaching you fluid mechanics or solid mechanics or compressible flow or any of those other things. I just want you to see these connections. So here's a, a couple examples. This is one that you'll see in 313 if you haven't taken it already or if you're, not take, if you're taking it now, you will eventually see the Moody diagram. So when you talk about turbulent pipe flows, this Moody diagram is universal. It's been around for many years, many decades, developed by Moody. And it's, it's actually one of the more interesting plots because it's a single plot that has a ton of information in it. So the way that you use this, if you've seen it before or if you haven't, the way this is used, you basically have three variables you have the relative roughness of the pipe surface. So that's epsilon over D. D is the diameter of the pipe. And epsilon is a measure of the roughness size. So if it's a, a concrete pipe, then the roughness is epsilon is gonna be relatively large. If it's a plexiglass pipe, then it's gonna be much smaller. If it's a steel pipe that's been nicely finished, it'll be medium, but small-ish. Uh, and so you, you generally look at a book or look at a table and it'll give you the epsilon over D for different types of materials. So you, here you can see some. So here's glass or plastic. And basically those are, what are these? Uh, so these are the roughnesses, right? So in feet or in millimeters. So for glass and plastic, they're essentially zero. For concrete, here's even wood, rubber, copper, cast iron, galvanic, blah, 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 blah. So you, you get the values of epsilon 
and you divide by the diameter. This, you can see, this is the smooth pipe curve. So this little bit darker curve that's kind of bounding all the other ones, that's the smooth pipe curve. And then one, each one of these other swoopy curves coming in from the right, each one of those is for a different epsilon over D, starting with zero here and then increasing. So the rougher the pipe, the higher you start over here. So for a very rough pipe, you're gonna start over here. And that curve is where you'll start with the epsilon over D. The second of the three parameters is the Reynolds number. And Reynolds number, which we'll talk about more in a moment, is a non-dimensional parameter that encapsulates, you can just think of it as velocity. It has some other stuff in it, as you'll see, but basically it's velocity. So as the velocity increases in the pipe, the Reynolds number increases. And so you have increasing Reynolds numbers with increasing epsilon over Ds. So you go in with your epsilon over D, find the appropriate curve, then you find your Reynolds number based on the velocity of the flow in the pipe, and you go up until you meet that curve, and then you go over to the left axis, which is what you're looking for, that's the friction factor F. So it's a quantification of how much effect the turbulence is gonna have on the friction between the, the fluid and the pipe surface. Obviously, if the surface is rougher, you're gonna have more of an effect on friction. If the Reynolds number is higher or lower, depending on the situation, that will also affect your friction factor. This straight line is actually for laminar flow. So laminar is boring flow, it's nice, neat. All the fluid particles just, just hold hands and go along through the pipe together, unlike turbulent flow, which is all jumbled and messy. So this is the laminar curve. It's actually a straight line. And then these are for the turbulent case. Okay, so there's a ton of information in there. And one way to use it is just as I just described. So you go in to use the table itself, going with the Reynolds number, epsilon over D, you find where those come together and you get your friction factor and then you use that friction factor in further calculations. That's one way. Another way is to use what's called the Colebrook equation, which is an equation that encapsulates all of that information that's in the Moody diagram. So it relates F, the friction factor, and I've highlighted in red because I'm, I'm gonna highlight in red the variable that we're actually looking for, the one that we're trying to get. So we get, have the friction factor here. We have the epsilon over D, or here I have it as E over D, should I guess be epsilon. Here's the Reynolds number, and then here's another F. You can see it's a highly nonlinear equation. I've got square roots. I've got log base tens of stuff. I've got one over square roots. So it's a highly nonlinear equation, which of course makes sense. This is highly nonlinear data. Uh, I think we covered all, well, here's the Reynolds number you can see. So it's rho VD over mu. Rho is the density of the fluid, just a property of the fluid. Mu is the viscosity of the fluid. Again, just the, the property of the fluid. V is the velocity in the pipe and D is the diameter of the pipe. So clearly we have a nonlinear relationship between F, the roughness and the Reynolds number. So if I have, my epsilon or E over D. And if I have the Reynolds number, how do I get F? I can't just solve for it. I can't solve for F is equal to some function of E over D and Reynolds number. So I have to use a root finding technique. It's a nonlinear root finding problem. Here's another one. This one is from MMAE for you aerospace engineers 311, which is compressible flow. So this is the supersonic flow past, I'll draw this figure on the next slide a little bit bigger so you can see it more clearly. So it's the flow, supersonic flow past a corner. And so you get a shock wave in the corner. And the question is, what's the angle of the shock wave? It's called an oblique shock wave because it's not 90 degrees, it's not normal. So what is the angle of that oblique shock wave? So similar to the Moody diagram, 
we can go in with the deflection angle of the, the corner and the Mach number coming in to the corner. And based on that, so here's the deflection angle based on the Mach number, we can go find sigma, which is the angle of the shockwave. So we can do that graphically similar to the Moody diagram. But uh, more interesting and more helpful is if we do this using an equation. And there is an equation for this, which we can take advantage of. So this is that same figure. I'm just going to draw it bigger. So we have a corner like this. This angle is delta. So that's the angle of the corner. I have a Mach number MX coming in. So that's the Mach number of the flow coming into the corner. And if that Mach number is greater than one, so it's supersonic, then I'm gonna get a shock wave here. So that's my shock wave. And it has an angle sigma. Then there's also a Mach number MY coming out. Whenever you go across a shock wave, everything changes. All the properties of the gas change. The Mach number changes, the temperature changes, the pressure changes, everything changes across the shock wave. It's an abrupt change. But again, the point here is, the question is, what is this sigma? Given a delta, given an incoming Mach number, what is the angle of the shock? Well, you asked, here's the answer. So there's a relationship between those where again, I've highlighted in red the sigma, which is the variable that we're looking for in terms of the delta, which we would be given and the incoming Mach number, which we would also be given. There's also a gamma here. The gamma is the same as in thermo. That's just the ratio of specific heat. So like for air, it's 1.4, it's just a number, it's a property of the gas. So given an MX Mach number upstream of the shock, given a deflection angle of the wedge, what is this shock angle? Here's the relationship between those three variables. And you can see again, it's highly nonlinear. I've got Mach number squares, I've got sine squares, I've got cotangents, I've got tangents of things. This is a highly nonlinear equation. Once again, I cannot solve for sigma equals some function of the ramp angle and the Mach number. So I have to solve this using some root finding technique. Maybe you've seen here in the, in the background this Julia set reference. Let me, and you're curious, curious as to why that's there. Let me show you why that's there. Oh, there's our sunspots. So the Julia set is a fractal. And fractals are these really interesting um, they're, they're, uh, you, so a mathematician will say they're mathematical, a uh, physicist will say they're physical, um, but the point is they have this very interesting and intriguing property, and that is when you look at a fractal, at every scale you look at it, spatial scale, you see very similar things. So one analogy, in nature is if you are on a satellite, you're out in space in orbit, and you look at the coastline of whatever, right? New Jersey, UK, wherever, and you see a pattern. As you get closer and closer and you zoom in, you see very similar patterns. Even down to the grain of sand level, you see very similar patterns. So that, that's the characteristic of a fractal is you see the same types of patterns on every scale. Now there's Mandelbrot sets, there's all kinds of these fractals, but the Julia set actually has a relationship to Newton's method. This one in particular, this is very interesting. 
So if I take and I want to solve z cubed minus one. So that's my f of z. Now z instead of x because it's complex. So it actually it's two dimensional. So z is x plus i y. So there's a real part x and an imaginary part y. That's not really that important. But it's z cubed minus one. That's my function that I want to find the roots of. Now it's a cubic, right? So there's three roots. Just like for the real case, for the complex case, there's three roots. There's three values of z in the complex plane that satisfies z cubed minus one is equal to zero. The question is, and what the Julia set shows, one way to interpret the Julia, Julia set, is it shows that if you, if you use Newton's method and you give an initial condition, so you have the two dimensional, you can think of the complex plane as two dimensional. The horizontal axis is x, and the vertical, ac vertical axis is y. So you have the real axis and the imaginary axis. But it's, again, it's just a two dimensional plane. So you start with the value of x and y. That's your initial guess. So that's a value of z. And you do Newton's method. And based on where you start, you'll get one of these three roots. The question is, which one do you get? So each of these colors, the green, the red, and the blue, represent the regions in the complex plane that lead to one of the three roots. So there's the green root, the red root, and the blue root. But it's far more interesting. So the pattern in the complex plane is far more interesting than you would ever expect. You would expect that if you start somewhere close to the blue root, well, you'll end up with the blue root. Start somewhere close to the green root, get to the green root. And for large portions of the complex plane, that's true. However, look at these interfaces between those three. So this red, just to the left of that center point, if I start at that corresponding value of z, I get the same root as if I started over on the right-hand side of the complex plane. And that continues all the way to the left. And you see all this beautiful pattern of these red, greens, and blues. And, but look what happens when I zoom in. It looks the same. It's the same basic underlying pattern. So that's why it's called a fractal. And you just go down deeper and deeper and deeper. The resolution of this, this figure doesn't allow me to go further than this. But you can see that within the structure that you see here, within that overall structure, you see very similar structures. I can zoom in over here, and I see a very similar structure. I can zoom in over here, and I see a very similar structure. I can zoom in further, and I'll see the same basic structure. So that's a fractal. The interesting thing about this is if I use a different method, instead of using Newton's method, if I use a different method, this will look totally different. So this is specific to Newton's method. The Julia set, this version of the Julia set is specific to Newton's method. If I use a different method to determine the roots, I will get a different pattern. So it's, it's uh, quite striking and beautiful. And it's just completely an artifact of the numerics. And so then, of course, that gets people all excited. Well, N Newton's method, that's just, that's just this numerical method. Why, we sh why should we expect to see anything beautiful coming out of some boring numerical method invented by guy, some guy hundreds of years ago? And, and we see this all over the place. We see it in nature where you just, it just blows your mind. You're like, okay, that's kind of cool. Wait, 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 let me stop and think about that. So this equation that you just wrote down, that says something about how nature actually behaves? Wait, 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 that's a mathematical equation. Didn't we invent math? So how can some invention of mankind, mathematics, explain Physics, the underlying physics of the universe. Well, that kind of blows my mind. 
So mind blown emojis all over the place. So, and again, this, this has nothing to do with physics at all. This is purely just a mathematical exercise using Newton's method. And you end up with this thing that you can get at using other means. The Julius set has many other origins other than Newton's method. So it's very beautiful visually, but it's even more beautiful when you start to think about the implications of that. And then you start thinking strange thoughts like, well, maybe mathematics wasn't invented. Maybe mathematics was not conjured up by us. Maybe there's some underlying thing that we discovered. Mathematics is more discovered. This is a raging debate among mathematicians and philosophers. Is mathematics discovered or is it invented? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yeah, it is. It's both. So in some other universe, there could be a different set of mathematics where instead of saying T-A-N for tan, they call it something else. But if they come up with something like Newton's method, whatever they want, it won't be the Newton's method, it'll be the, you know, whatever your favorite aliens method is. And it won't be, they won't call it Z cubed minus one, it'll be called something else, but the underlying mathematics will be the same. Or will it? Anyway, whew, oh boy, since chills down my spine. So anyway, that's another interesting application of Newton's method. Let's get back to these. Let me, let me just ask you, look at these two equations. So here's the relationship between the delta angle, the sigma angle, and the incoming Mach number. Look at this equation. And then look at this equation for the Colebrook equation for Moody's diagram, relating F with E over D and Reynolds number. Just by looking at it, where do you think this equation came from? Oh, it came from Colebrook, Professor Castle. Yeah, I know. But how did Colebrook come up with this equation, do you think? Just based on other things that you've seen in, in your engineering classes, you see an equation like that, and if you had to guess, how did they get that equation? What would you say? Just based on your intuition. Same token, how would you guess that they got this equation? And of course, you're all like, I have no idea what he's talking about. So here are the alternatives. Where, what, are the, what are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is I just took the Moody diagram as a big data set and I did a giant curve fit on it. I do a curve fit on it, and this is what I get. That's one possibility. Another possibility is I understand the underlying physics. I have the equations that explain the underlying physics. So if I want to relate A to B, I can use those equations to come up with what we call a first principles relationship between A and B. So first principles means it comes from the actual physics. It's not a curve fit, it's derived from the physics. So F equals MA, is that a curve fit? No, that comes from actual physics. F equals MA, you do experiments, they obey F equals MA, Newton's second law. Now it's actually not a law, it's a model because it's not always correct. At very high speeds, Newton's second law fails us. We have to use uh, relativity theory and so forth, thanks to Einstein. So with that in mind, basically those are the two possibilities. So any equation that you ever see in a class, ask yourself or ask the instructor or the book, where did you get this equation? Now, sometimes it'll be obvious because they'll derive it for you. If they derive it, well, that's based on first principles. So they'll start with something like, if we apply conservation of energy to X, Y, Z, do the derivation, we end up with this relationship. That's first principles, conservation of energy. If the discussion is more, well, here's this nasty set of data that someone got from a bunch of experiments, and we'd like to put it into some nice equation form like this, 
well, not so nice, but some equation form and do some sort of curve fit. Those are basically the two alternatives. So given that, you basically have two choices. Is this one first principles, do you think? No, why not? Doesn't look like it because there's weird constant, exactly. Here's the clue. This is not even put in as two. It's 2.0, 2 2.51. You don't get, now you might get a two, but you're not gonna get a 2.0, or you're not gonna get a 2.5. So what this means is to two significant figures, it's 2.0. If I had the third significant figure, it might be 2.03. And this one, obviously, that's not something that you don't get 2.51s from a first principles derivation. So this is a curve fit. Now it's an amazing curve fit because how do they figure out that they should take the log base 10 of the E over D plus something over Reynolds numbers times the square root of, of F. So there's something that went into that. I mean, this is not linear regression, that's for sure. This is not polynomial regression, that's for sure. So this is a pretty amazing curve fit. And so, yeah, give Colebrook credit. The point, however, is this came from empirical data. And empirical is just a fancy word for experiments. So people did a whole bunch of experiments. That's where the Moody diagram came from. That's how we got this Moody diagram. This is an amazing feat of patience and persistence to do all the experiments necessary to compile all that data. That's amazing. And in some ways, even more amazing is to figure out that you could do a curve fit to an equation like this. And it's actually not that complicated for is as complicated as the data is. Now look at this one. Do you think this is first principles or do you think this is from empirical data with a curve fit? First principles, yeah, no weird constants. Now, I'm sure you could, instead of studying for the exam next week, don't do this, but you could, instead of studying for the exam next week, you could go through all of physics and chemistry and biology and, and, and somewhere find some first principle equation that has some weird constant in it, quote unquote, and then throw it in my face, ha, 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 you're wrong. Well, good for you. But 99 out of 100 times, when you see an equation like this, it's from first principles. It's giving you a very precise and clear relationship between all of these variables. More often than not, when you see weird constants like this, when you see log base tens, there is nothing in nature that's log base 10. Oh, okay, Castle, I'm gonna find it. Go ahead, waste your time and find it. Maybe you'll find something. But basically, log base tens don't come out of nature. Someone dreamt that up and did a curve fit. All right, Whew, that was exciting. Went a long diatribe about that. And I hope we have a witty, witty comment in the chat. Guess and check. There is that. Guess and check. You can always resort to guess and check. It, what's funny is when I was in school, we always called that trial and error. Actually, the way you guys describe it as guess and check makes a lot more sense. Trial and error makes it sound like, well, we're, you're always gonna be wrong. So you try something and well, what's the error? There is error because you're always wrong. At least you guys give yourself the satisfaction of maybe being right because you guess something and you check and maybe it checks out right here and there. Okay, so that's my long diatribe about that. Uh, and laws, okay, laws versus models. Last class on Tuesday, we talked about the ideal gas. Most people call it law. If you go back and watch the video carefully, I never once, I hope, referred to it as the ideal gas law. It is not a law, it is a model. A law is something that is always true. So conservation of energy, 
as far as we know, every place we've searched so far in the universe, we can't find any place or in any fashion that conservation of energy is, is not satisfied. So that, as far as we can tell, is a law. So the first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved, that is indeed a law, as far as we know. F equals MA is not a law, it's a model. Now, it's a model that works very well, and we didn't even, we didn't throw it away when Einstein came along and gave us relativity. We didn't say, oh, well, let's do relativity calculations now for everything, and we'll never use F equals MA. As engineers, we almost never use relativistic or even consider relativistic effects as, as engineers, because most of our things are like this big and moving this fast, as opposed to ginormous or itty bitty small and moving at ridiculous speeds, close to the speed of light. So for most of the things we care about, if I drop my cell phone on the floor, and I wanna know if it's gonna break, I don't need to worry about relativistic effects. F equals MA tells me all I need to know. So anyway, my point is we have to be careful about what we refer to as laws versus models. Many of the things that we actually refer to as laws are actually models, like the ideal gas equation of state is a model. It is not a law, nor is the van der Waals equation of state a law. It's a better model than ideal gas, but it's still not a law. Okay, that was fun. Typing systems. So this is relating to back to 313 fluids. So, so far we've talked about one pipe and some fluid going through it. And what is the effect of friction on the fluid in that pipe? Piping systems are obviously more complicated. So now we have lots of pipes, we have uh, elbows, we have T connections, we have changing altitudes, we have all kinds of things. We can have a pump, we can have a turbine in there, all kinds of things going on in piping systems. We could have parallel flows where the flow can go through one pipe or the other. So there's all kinds of things that can go on in these piping systems. Once again, my objective here is not to teach you piping systems. And I'm not going to ask you a question on an exam to solve some piping system. However, I just find it as an engineer a whole lot more interesting to talk about Newton's method and root finding in the context of a physical problem, a physical example. So that's why I do it, because my hope is it's the same for you guys, that it's a lot more interesting. All right. So let's come back to the Reynolds number. So we have the Reynolds number which is rho VD over mu. So these are properties of the, the fluid. Then this is going to be the average velocity, we call V bar for average velocity, and then the diameter of the pipe. So that's a non-dimensional number. If you look at the units for those, it has no units. We, in fluid dynamics, fluid dynamics and heat transfer, we love non-dimensional numbers. And the reason is because they encapsulate the effects of multiple things into one number. So I could change the pipe and keep everything else the same. What is the effect of that? Or I could increase the velocity, but keep everything else the same, the same pipe and the same fluid. Or I could keep the same velocity in the same pipe, but I change the fluid. What is the effect of those things? This tells me exactly what the effect is. The effect of doubling the diameter is the same as the effect of doubling the velocity, which is the same as the effect of having the viscosity. They all give me the same Reynolds number and therefore the same underlying flow. Not the same velocities, diameters, and, and fluid properties, but the effect of all those things together is the same. So we love these. And everyone actually should be using non-dimensional numbers all the time. It would make our lives a whole lot easier. All right, uh, I should bring a soapbox because I'm spending a lot of time on my soapbox lately. Okay, so in general, for a given pipe diameter D, a given fluid, we have, and uh, it, so just think of, again, one pipe, so that's a certain size, one fluid, so we're pumping water, say, 
changing V then changes the Reynolds number. If I double the velocity, I double the Reynolds number. So I will talk in terms of increasing velocity, decreasing the velocity, increasing Reynolds number, decreasing Reynolds number. And, and just to simplify the discussion, but know that we could accomplish the same effect overall by changing these other parameters as well. Well, conservation of energy, the law of conservation of energy, we can apply to a control volume in a pipe. So you'll do this in 313. If you haven't taken that already, you'll do it. If the flow is inviscid, which is just a fancy way of saying that we're not gonna take into account friction in the fluid. We're just gonna pretend that there's no friction. Of course, there's always friction. So this is a model. It is not a law. So in viscid flows or frictionless flows, we have the pressure P, we have the velocity V, and we have the elevations Z. And when we apply conservation of energy, you go through a first principles derivation. This is not a curve fit. Go through a first principles derivation. You end up with the famed Bernoulli equation, which is this. Now I have to talk about the Bernoullis. The Bernoullis. The Bernoullis are like the Kardashians of the 1600s. So there's three famous Bernoullis. There's father and two sons, Johann, Daniel, and who's the third? I'll remember in a second. I can't remember the third. They were all mathematicians, but they're kind of competitive. So they would do things like one of the Bernoullis would solve some strange math problem. And then they would put it up on social media and challenge other math. I mean, sorry, they would publish it and challenge other mathematicians to solve it. And of course they usually knew when they did that, whether there was a solution or not. And if there was, they knew what it was. And then they would poke fun at people, including their own family members for not being able to figure out the solution. So that's why I say they're the kind of like the Kardashians of the 1600s. So there's lots of drama, very competitive amongst each other. This Bernoulli, this is Daniel Bernoulli. So the Bernoulli equation in fluid mechanics is from Daniel Bernoulli. So some of the other Bernoulli things in mathematics, they're from the other two Bernoullis or, or from Daniel. But anyway, so this is the Bernoulli equation. This is what it looks like. So it relates the pressure. So I have a pipe. Maybe it goes like this. It's got an inlet, I, and an exit, E. And there's a mass flow rate, M dot, going through it. Mass flow rate is the amount of fluid passing through the pipe. So we have the difference in pressure, difference in velocity squared, and difference in elevation, Z. And for an inviscid flow, they're all related in this nice, neat algebraic way. No derivatives, no integrals, beautiful, simple equation. So you tell me what is the pressure, velocity, and altitude here. Tell me what the pressure and altitude is here, and I'll tell you what the velocity is there. Or you give me you know, other things, and you ask me for one, and I'll give you that. It's very simple algebraic equation. Now for the more realistic case where you have a viscous flow, so now you include the effects of viscosity and friction in the flow in the pipe, then you get what's called the extended Bernoulli equation. So it still has all these terms in them, the same as in the regular Bernoulli equation, but then you have these additional terms, uh, which I'll describe next. So H sub L, that's called the head loss, Head is, if I have a fluid going through a pipe and I wanna know what's the pressure, I could drill a little hole and put a tube on it. And you'll do this in the lab. And then as the water or whatever fluid is going through the pipe, it'll, based on the pressure in the, the pipe, it'll push the fluid up to a certain height. That height is called the head. So it's related to the pressure. So the head loss, which is what happens because of the fictional effects. So head is that pressure. So if I have a straight horizontal pipe of constant elevation, constant diameter, and I do two pressure taps, 
Upstream, I'll have a higher head, larger head, higher pressure. Downstream, I have a smaller head, lower pressure. So there's a pressure loss because I need a pressure difference to push the fluid to overcome the friction. Friction is always pushing upstream, so I have to overcome that with the pressure gradient, higher pressure upstream, lower pressure downstream. So that's all related to the head loss. How much head do I lose because of frictional effects in the pipe? The W dot shaft and M dot, M dot, remember, that's just the mass flow rate. So how much fluid is passing through the pipe? Dot represents a time effect here, a time derivative. So the M W dot shaft over M dot, that comes from if I had a pump. So if I have a pump in the, so I have a pipe and I insert a pump, I'm putting work into the fluid from the pump. And so that is measured with respect to the mass flow rate as W dot shaft over M dot. Now, if there is no pump, then of course this would just then be zero. So this is because of frictional losses in a pipe. And this is because of energy that's being added because of a pump. Could also be a turbine, which would be taking energy out. But we'll just think in terms of a pump. All right, so there's two types of head losses. I'll just introduce these and then we're out of time. So there are major losses and minor losses. Now, using the terms major and minor sounds like one is big and one is small. That's, that's not the way to think about it. A major loss means it's occurring over large portions of the system. A minor loss is a local loss because of something locally. So major losses are because of long straight pipe sections. So it's big. That's what major in this context means. It's a big thing and you have losses because you have to push all this fluid to overcome friction through this long section of a pipe. A minor loss, again, is not necessarily small, but it's local. So this is some local feature in the piping system. It could be that there is a bend in the pipe. Could be that there's a contraction, the pipe gets smaller or it gets bigger, so there's an expansion. It could be that there's a pump in there, and so there's losses because of the presence of those local features in the piping system. We'll talk about those next time because we're out of time. Uh, are there any questions before we adjourn? Okay, so schedule. Prom set two, uh, three is due tomorrow, midnight, one minute before. Those will get graded uh, over the weekend, and then you'll get those results back before the exam a week from today. And again, I will uh, be sending out more information about the logistics for remote students. And again, probably a request for you guys to let me know how many of you plan to take it in person somehow. And there is still the open question of whether I will give out a previous exam as an example or how I'll handle that. So I'll let you know about all that in the coming few days. Have a good weekend and see you Tuesday. Thank you.